Tonight, the torch of idealism is lit in thousands of homes and tens of thousands of towns. It cannot go out. It will not go out. It will continue to burn. The Apple TV Plus series for all mankind operates under the assumption that a sustained space race could have moved technological advancements along at a much faster pace than we experienced in our timeline. In the show's version of events, the Soviet Union space program held on to its lead and landed on the moon first, setting up a series of ripple effects. In its own right, For All Mankind is a solid character drama with a healthy amount of space porn that just works. But the timeline changes provide an extra layer that keeps me hooked into this series because who doesn't wonder what might have been if things had gone in a slightly different direction. In my last video on this subject, I covered the changes that happened in the years between 1969 and 1982. This included the show's first season and the time jump between that and season two. The show has established a pattern of jumping ahead about a decade between seasons and utilizes an opening montage and series of featurettes to fill in the gaps. The timeline actually diverged because of a change in 1966, which I'll come back to shortly. And the further we get from that, the more the alternate timeline becomes distinct. In this video, I'll be looking at the years 1983 through 1992, discussing the events in the second season and the time jump before season three. That will set things up for another installment once season four is released to give us the traditional time skip montage and fill us in on how things have changed. My last video ended with the 1982 crisis in Berlin that foreshadowed the coming conflict on the moon in season two, which all took place in 1983. While the conflict is the main focus, in the background we catch glimpses of how consumer tech innovations arrive sooner in the For All Mankind timeline. Things like electric vehicles, mobile phones, electronic mail, which is called D-mail rather than email, laptops, LEDs, and flat panel displays all show up much earlier than in our timeline. Some of these are more believable than others, but overall I think the show does a good job of including these details to keep the feeling of things advancing at an accelerated pace due to the increased spending on the space program and NASA's ability to patent their inventions, which gives them the opportunity to reinvest the profits in their own programs. In the early part of season two, things heat up on the moon after American astronauts discover a mining site that could contain significant lithium deposits. Because of the limited crew at their disposal, the site had to be left unguarded, and the Soviets moved in to occupy it as soon as they got a chance. President Reagan insisted on taking it back, which prompted the military liaison, General Bradford, to send armed marines to retake the site, and then remain to serve as an armed detail to protect it around the clock. In the meantime on Earth, while the U.S. is recovering from a solar event, the president decides to offer a joint mission to the USSR to have a cosmonaut and astronaut come together for a symbolic handshake in space to show their common cause. The powers that be don't think it will ever happen, so they're quite surprised when the Soviets accept the offer. They send a delegation, and their cosmonauts are welcomed by the U.S. commander Danielle Poole, who then travels to the Soviet Union's training center, Star City. The joint mission is based on a real event that took place in our timeline in 1975 called the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project. The first manned international space mission was also proposed as a way to promote the detente in American-Soviet relations at that point in history. This event had familiar names on both sides that you'd recognize just from watching the show. The Soyuz commander, cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, was the first man to set foot on the moon in the TV show's timeline. In real life, he did take part in the famous handshake with NASA commander Thomas P. Stafford, but also posed for what is arguably the most iconic image from the mission with astronaut Deke Slayton. The character Deke had a similar story to his namesake of being part of the Mercury 7 and then being grounded for medical reasons. In real life, this was his only space flight, and he died years later of natural causes on Earth rather than in space on the show's Apollo 24 rescue mission. 
The next big occurrence on the alternate timeline is also based on a real world event. Korean Airlines Flight 007 is shot down by a Soviet fighter after it crosses over into restricted airspace. In the show's version, NASA Administrator Thomas Paine is killed along with the other 268 passengers, which included U.S. Representative Larry McDonald. In real life, the date and location were the same, as was McDonald being on board. But in the show, this is all connected to a secret Soviet base where they were building and testing the Buran shuttle. In both instances, this marked a new height in Cold War tensions, and in the show it led to the decision to arm the U.S.'s new shuttle Pathfinder and to accelerate the timeline for retaking the lunar mining site. It also led to the Apollo-Soyuz astronauts being locked in their rooms in Star City, which provided the show with a chance to introduce the character who was responsible for the shift to the alternate timeline. While she's detained, Danny is visited by the Soviet space program's chief engineer, Sergei Korolev. In our timeline, Korolev died due to complications in what was supposed to be a somewhat routine surgery in 1966. The Soviet space program never really recovered after his death, so when the show's creators were looking for ways that the space race might continue beyond the moon landing and the subsequent Apollo missions, they came up with the idea of Korolev surviving. In an interview with Collider, Ronald D. Moore said that they started with the idea that he survived the surgery and was able to solve their rocket design flaws to keep the Soviet program together. This led to an accelerated program with continued funding that changed everything and led to the show's alternative timeline. The real Korolev story is fascinating and that his identity was kept secret while he was alive adds to the impact of his scene with Commander Poole. On the moon, the Marines are able to retake the mining site, but a few days later, they shoot two cosmonauts that were returning, and one of them dies. Around the same time in September, the Soviets successfully launched their shuttle, the Buran, and the U.S. launched Pathfinder for its first mission to escort Sea Dragon 17. At Jamestown, the cosmonaut who survived the shooting wakes up saying that he wants to defect. In response, an armed Soviet unit attempted to seize the base, starting the Jamestown crisis. In the skirmish, a second nuclear reactor that was unknown to most of NASA because it was there to make weapons on the moon was damaged by gunfire. Gordo and Tracy Stevens heroically sacrificed themselves to prevent that from melting down. In orbit, the Buran blockades the base because they believe that Sea Dragon 17 is transporting nuclear weapons to the moon. Sea Dragon tries to complete its mission, leading to a standoff between Buran and Pathfinder. Commander Ed Baldwin orders Sally Ride to lock their weapon systems on the Soviet shuttle, but she refuses. When he relieves her of duty, she threatens him with her firearm, pleading with him to not fire their missiles. At the last minute, he decides to fire them on Sea Dragon instead, which ends the conflict. This was pivotal because the Soviets would have to retaliate if the Buran had been destroyed. We'll get to what their response would have been in a second, but destroying Sea Dragon was much easier to cover up. The government issued a statement saying that it failed due to faulty wiring and never had to reveal its true mission or how close Buran and Pathfinder came to firing on each other. In real life, in 1983, Sally Ride became the first American woman to fly in space on the STS-7 mission. It was NASA's seventh space shuttle mission and the second mission for the Space Shuttle Challenger. She was the third woman overall to fly in space after cosmonauts Valentina Tereshkova in 1963 and Svetlana Savitskaya in 1982. At 32 years of age, she was the youngest American astronaut to have flown in space. While the standoff between Pathfinder and Buran was happening, Mission Control was trying to recall Apollo Soyuz because the Soviet fleet off the coast of Panama was threatening a nuclear strike on the southern United States. This would be their response if things escalated above Jamestown base. Danielle refuses the order and tells JSC that they're moving forward with the docking procedure. Ellen Wilson, who serves as NASA's acting director, decides to let that happen. The crews do complete the first handshake in space and fulfill the mission's objective of being a symbol of peace and cooperation. After seeing this on TV, President Reagan diverts Air Force One to Moscow, where he meets with the Soviet premier and nuclear war is averted. 
Season two ends with the formation of the Rogers Commission to investigate the Jamestown incident. In 1984, they released their findings, concluding that Soviet gunfire caused the cooling system to fail and the reactor to overheat. The report cites the heroic actions of Tracy and Gordo, but leaves out the details about the existence of a second reactor and its function of refining weapons-grade plutonium. This leads to skepticism about the official story in a situation where we know the skeptics are right, and that the government orchestrated what it's calling a conspiracy theory. In our timeline, the Rogers Commission existed to investigate the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. We learned that that was averted in the alternate timeline when Margot subtly warned Sergei about the problem they discovered with their boosters because she knew the Soviets were working off of stolen plans before the corrections were made. This was an attempt to save lives and further advancements in space exploration, but it also opened her up to being compromised by Soviet intelligence in the future. The resolution of the Jamestown crisis opened the door for Reagan and Andropov to finalize a lunar peace agreement that essentially divides the moon in two. In 1984, we continued to see ripple effects across the alternate timeline. In June, Michael Jordan was drafted by the Portland Trailblazers with their first pick in the NBA draft. In our timeline, they famously missed that opportunity, allowing Chicago to draft him as their first pick. In October, the Irish Republican Army assassinated British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in the Brighton Hotel bombing. This is based on an event that occurred in our timeline that killed five people, but Thatcher narrowly escaped the explosion. In November, the Democrat Senator Gary Hart won the U.S. presidential election, defeating Reagan's Vice President Richard Schweiker. In our timeline, Hart came in second to Walter Mondale in 1984, and then he was widely viewed as the frontrunner to be the Democratic presidential nominee in 1988, until reports surfaced of an extramarital affair and caused him to withdraw. He did re-enter the race, but withdrew a second time after performing poorly in the early primaries. Nothing of note occurred in 1985, but there is a short from that year that shows that the development of the internet is restricted in the alternate timeline. The government still developed ARPANET, but didn't lift patent restrictions to allow developers the freedom to create something similar to the World Wide Web like they did in our timeline. In 1986, Mikhail Gorbachev became premier of the USSR. He enacts policies that put the Soviet economy into hyperdrive, according to the news reports. At the same time, a global space boom started to take off. India becomes the latest nation to launch its own space station, joining nearly a dozen other countries. Thanks to advancements from the American and Soviet space programs, construction and launch costs have been dramatically reduced. This made it possible for countries with fewer resources to get involved and paved the way for private industry. Polaris Space Tours emerged as the world's first space tourism company, founded by Sam Cleveland and Karen Baldwin. They unveiled their first space plane, Polaris One, and started offering commercial flights to low Earth orbit. In this section, there are two things in the newsreel that appear to be the same in both timelines. James Cameron's film Aliens looks to be equally as popular, and the AIDS epidemic seems to be equally devastating. In our timeline, Ronald Reagan famously ignored the crisis in his first term and only acknowledged it under pressure in what would have been Gary Hart's first term in the show's timeline. Based on what little we see, we can presume that things followed a similar trajectory. And in other political news, Ellen Wilson was elected senator in Texas running as a Republican. One of the most significant scientific advancements came in 1987 when Deb Iessa and Richard Hilliard created a nuclear fusion reactor. The fusion process combines the nuclei of helium-3 atoms and is a much cleaner process that doesn't produce the large amounts of radioactive waste that the nuclear fission process does in our timeline. The problem with helium-3 is that it's rare on Earth, but as it turns out, there's plenty of it on the moon. By mining that and bringing it back to run these reactors, they can produce enough clean nuclear power to meet the world's energy needs through the next century and beyond. IS's company Helios wins NASA's mining contract and declares the dawn of the commercial space age. The Soviets launched their own helium-3 mining operation, and Gary Hart called for increasing the production of electric cars. And this all helps to start to reverse the effects of global warming. 
The space race expanded when in June of 87, Chinese Premier Deng Xiaoping announced that China would have lunar parity with the superpowers by 1990, adding that the Chinese would open their first lunar base the next month. Since John Lennon survived the attempt on his life in the alternate timeline, the Beatles launched a reunion tour in 1987. Their first performance in Chicago marked the first time they performed together since 1966. Season 3's opening newsreel also features an article about Jonathan Pollard's conviction for selling intelligence secrets to Israel. As far as I can tell, this happened the same way in both timelines. It also shows a clip of baby Jessica being rescued after falling into a well, with no discernible differences from how that happened in our timeline. On April 19, 1988, Arnaldo Martinez Verdugo became the first Marxist president of Mexico. His new government moved swiftly to establish close diplomatic ties with the Soviet Union and to nationalize banks and businesses deemed critical to national interest. This would be unthinkable in our timeline. But in the show, the United States has adopted a more laissez-faire attitude after the peace negotiations averted nuclear war in the Panamanian and Jonestown conflicts. It appears that in the show, the U.S. government does recognize democratically elected governments around the globe, which is a stark contrast to what happened in our timeline in South America and around the world during the Cold War. As a result, communist governments have taken control in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Colombia, Turkey, Egypt, Greece, and elsewhere. These countries have been enticed by Mikhail Gorbachev's vision of a hybrid economic system that adopts aspects of free enterprise with the broad social safety net of communism. The show never really elaborates on this, but it hints that in the context of the ongoing space race and the USSR's decision to withdraw their forces from the Afghan border in 1979 in the show's timeline, Gorbachev's reforms were effective in the same way Deng's were in China in our timeline which is a stark contrast to the Soviet Union's attempted perestroika reforms in the late 80s. As you would imagine, there was congressional pushback to Mexico's new government, though. In a newspaper article that appears to be misdated 1986 instead of 1988 in the opening montage, you see that there was a security resolution to secure America's southern border and that a delegation of Republicans were led by Senator Bob Dole to the Oval Office to urge President Hart to break off diplomatic relations with Mexico. The president remained steadfast citing the disastrous event in Panama. He said that while he is adamantly opposed to that system of government, the past has taught us that disagreements between friends do not have to bring us to the brink of World War III. In our timeline, the results of the 1988 presidential election in Mexico are widely considered to have been fraudulent. It was the first competitive presidential election since the PRI party took power in 1929 and resulted in them retaining power after fabricating a story about the breakdown of a new vote tabulation system. The opposing parties contested and protests broke out across the country but the PRI's claims of victory were never overturned. In other news, North Korea abandoned its ballistic missile program to focus on its space program, and Gary Hart was re-elected in a landslide, beating evangelist Pat Robertson. Robertson did run for the Republican nomination in our timeline in 1988, but dropped out when it became clear that he couldn't challenge Vice President George H.W. Bush. There are a couple of familiar clips mixed into the opening montage here, like scenes from the movies Rain Man and Short Circuit and Kirk Gibson's pinch hit walk off home run in the 1988 World Series. There's a Chiron that claims the Dow source 1200 points and that the New York Stock Exchange caps a record week. That might indicate that the U.S. economy is a lot stronger in the alternate timeline. In real life, there was a significant stock market crash in 1987, and the economy did bounce back in 1988, but the number 1200 seems completely out of place in relation to gains at that period in history. In 1989, five moon marines were killed in an event that's remembered as the Pathfinder tragedy. The shuttle unexpectedly depressurized, and the marines' death led to the temporary grounding of the Pathfinder fleet. 
In the same year, the fleet helped launch the Thomas Paine Orbital Telescope and the Moon Lab Research Station. The Thomas Paine Telescope resembles the James Webb Space Telescope from our timeline, which wasn't launched until 2021. This serves as a subtle reminder of how quickly things are advancing in the alternate timeline. And in that same year, Michael Jordan leads the Portland Trail Blazers to their first NBA championship since 1977. Jordan's career seems to be on the same path as it was in Chicago in our timeline. In September 1989, Dr. James Hansen testified in front of Congress that global warming has slowed due to reduced carbon emissions from humanity's shift to nuclear fusion from fossil fuels. This is essentially the opposite of what Hansen reported in his famous congressional testimony in 1988 in our timeline. In that, the NASA climate scientist reported that he was 99% certain the Earth was warmer than at any time in the history of instrumental measurements. And there was a clear cause and effect relationship with the greenhouse effect. This helped raise broad awareness of global warming. And while his statements received constant and continued scrutiny, his predictions have proven to be accurate. As we cross into the 1990s, There's concern that North Korea is secretly developing long-range weapon capabilities under the cover of its space program. It's a reminder that Cold War tensions between the U.S. and the USSR continue. And there's a news report about President Hart recalling the U.S. ambassador from Moscow after five small listening devices were discovered in the American embassy. In 1990, NASA unveiled a statue of Gordo and Tracy Stevens in their duct tape suits outside of the Johnson Space Center. And in the same year, the biopic Love in the Skies was released, starring Dennis Quaid as Gordo and Meg Ryan as Tracy. In the same year, Mikhail Gorbachev and Fidel Castro celebrated the anniversary of the October Revolution in East Germany. Gorbachev also meets with real estate mogul Donald Trump, who hopes to build luxury condos in the Soviet Union. Danny Stevens, son of Tracy and Gordo, becomes an astronaut and visits Jamestown Base. And Polaris announces their plans to build a space hotel in orbit to expand their space tourism business. In early 1991, the U.S. refused to intervene when Iraq invaded Kuwait. By this time in the alternate timeline, it appears that the Middle East is losing most of its strategic importance in a world that doesn't run on fossil fuels. In our timeline, President George H.W. Bush formed a U.S.-led coalition of 35 nations and launched a military assault on Iraq after the Kuwait invasion. What is now known as the Gulf War ended quickly after Iraqi forces retreated and Bush declared Kuwait had been liberated. Of course, Bush's son, George W., eventually invaded Iraq in 2003 under the false claim that the country possessed weapons of mass destruction. And based on how things have developed, it would make sense that this and most of the other conflicts the U.S. has been engaged in since the early 90s could be avoided in the alternate timeline. Instead of going to war, they're still trying to get a win in space, which leads to a turn to the race to Mars. NASA announced plans for Sojourner 1, their first manned mission to Mars, and that they plan to launch Sojourner in 1996. Kurt Cobain and Nirvana still took the music world by storm in the early 90s, and it'll be interesting to see if he survives the decade in the show's timeline. In ours, the singer, guitarist, and songwriter died in 1994. Ellen Wilson, the girl who caught the tank, and U.S. Republican Senator announced she'll be running for president in 1992. She's pitted against the party's frontrunner, Bob Dole. If she wins the nomination, she'll be running against the Democratic Party candidate, Bill Clinton, who defeated Gary Hart's vice president, Al Gore. Ross Perot is also running as an independent, campaigning on balancing the budget and ending the outsourcing of American energy and jobs to the moon. In our timeline, Bill Clinton took the lead as the Democratic frontrunner for president and selected Al Gore as his running mate. They ran against the incumbent Republican president, George H.W. Bush, who Pat Buchanan tried to primary after he lost some support for breaking his pledge against raising taxes. And Ross Perot did also run that year, mounting one of the most successful third-party campaigns of the modern age. 
And that is pretty much everything you need to know about the alternate timeline changes between 1983 and 1992. And I think that is a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.